Welcome back to uh, the second day of day six, uh, or the second session of day six. Uh, in the first session, we talked about the basic rules of differentiation, constant uh, rule, the sum and difference rule. Um, today, what we're going to discuss is the product rule, quotient rule, and a thing called the chain rule. And I'm going to start off with the chain rule and indicate why it is that we need this. So if we have a composition of functions, that's when you're going to be using the chain rule. So I've got three functions here, f of x, g of x, and h of x. Um, a square root function, a linear function, and a quadratic function. And I want to determine what f of g of h of x is, and then subsequently, what would its derivative be? All right, so we start up by first figuring out what is f of g of h of x. All right, let's get started. So remember, f of g of h of x means I'm first going to calculate what g of h of x is, and then take that and put it into the x's of f of x. So if I do that on the left-hand side here, g of h of x would mean take h of x and replace the x's in g of x um, with x squared. So that will become... 2x squared minus 1. So this now represents um, g of h of x. And now we're going to take that and put it into the x's of f, and then we'll end up getting f of g of h of x. So that ends up being just the square root of 2x squared minus 1. And then subsequently, you know, we can easily take the derivative of this because I just have to raise this to the one half, but the chain rule is going to kick in. And you need to understand uh, how that works. So let's take a look at. So there's the uh, f of g of h of x that I just calculated above. Uh, you might want to do the others. Well, let's just do one together here. If I want to calculate what is uh, f of h of g of x, you know, I don't expect it to be the same thing h of g of x would be go to h and replace its x's with g of x. So that would be 2x minus 1, that's g of x, but then I'm putting it into the x of h of x, so that becomes that squared, and now we're calculating f of that, so that would be the square root of that. Okay, very different looking function. All right, you might want to do the others just as, a, as an exercise. And the question is now, how do I take its derivative? All right, well, to go back to this picture for a moment, um, when we do the derivative of f of g of h of x, we're going to be starting by um, calculating the derivative of the outside function with respect to the inner function. So down here, I'm just going to summarize this. So if q of x, for example, is equal to f of g of h of x, then q prime, or the derivative of that function, you evaluate the derivatives working from the outside in. So it's the derivative of the outside, f prime, evaluated at the inside. And then you work your way inwards. Now I do the derivative of the inside of this, which would be g prime of h of x. And then finally, the derivative of the inside of that, which is h prime. So this is a demonstration of how the chain rule works. Now we're going to see it in action here. Given that y is equal to some function of u, and u is equal to some function of x, there's two ways I could do this. I could calculate what y is in terms of x by replacing all the u's there with, uh, uh, with what u is, and then I'll get y as a function of x, and then we could do dy by dx. But sometimes that's a lot of work to do. It's much easier if I use this chain rule. So the chain rule says that if I want the derivative of y with respect to x, I'll first take the derivative of y with respect to u, so in our case, it's going to be 3u squared minus 2. 
So that's dy by du. And now we want to multiply this by the derivative of u with respect to x. And here's u. This is just 3x to the 1 half. And so its derivative with respect to x is 3 halves x to the minus 1 half. Now, I've got u's and x's here. So I'm going to replace this u um, with what u is, just so that you'll see that these two different uh, ways of doing it turn out to be the same. So this ends up being 3 times u, but u is just 3x to the 1 half, and then we're squaring it, minus 2, times 3 halves x to the minus 1 half, This 3 is getting squared, so that'll be 9 times 3 is 27. x to the 1 half squared would just be x. So that's just 27 minus 2. And we're multiplying that by 3 halves x to the minus a half. And if I distribute the second bracket, that ends up 3 times 27 is 81 halves x to the 1 half. And then if I multiply uh, 2 times that, we end up getting 3x to the minus 1 half. And if we go back to radical notation, so this is just 81 square root x all over 2 minus 3 over the square root of x. Now, alternatively, I could have just replaced uh, u with uh, what it was, namely a function of x and now take this guy's derivative. So before doing that, as I said in the earlier session, always try and simplify um, expressions before you take their derivative. So this ends up being um, 3 times, or oh, 3 cubed, so that would be, that would be 3 cubed is 27, and this is x to the 1 half cubed, so that becomes x to the 3 halves minus, and then this is 2 times 3, so that's 6x to the 1 half plus 1. And now if we calculate dy by dx, remember it's 3 halves times 27, so that becomes 81 over 2x. Then you subtract 1 from the exponent, so that becomes 1 half minus this 1 half times 6, that becomes 3 x and reduce the half by 1 so that becomes negative 1 half and then the derivative of 1 of course is 0 and so this ends up being 81 root x all over 2 minus 3 over root x and as you can see these things agree with each other they're exactly the same okay we'll see more examples of the chain rule as we go along now Next one is, how does one handle the derivative of the product of two functions? Given that h of x is equal to f times g, so the product of two functions involving x, um, what, what would h prime be? Well, it's not this. Okay, so you might instinctively think um, it's f prime of x times g of x. In some ways, the, that intuition kind of makes sense that it ought to be this because you know derivatives are just limits. And one of the limit rules was that when you do the limit of a function or a product of functions, just the product of the limits. But as it turns out, this doesn't work when you go to do the derivative. And you're going to see why in a moment. We're going to actually calculate what the, uh, uh, the h prime is from first principles. So this is known as the product rule. So given that q of x is the product of f and g, remember that q prime is just the limit as h goes to 0 of q of x plus h minus q of x all over h. So in this case, this becomes the limit as h goes to 0. Now q of x plus h means go to q and replace all its x's with x plus h. So that becomes f of x plus h times g of x plus h, so that's f of x plus h, oh sorry, q of x plus h, minus q of x, but q of x is just f of x times g of x, and this is all divided by h.
All right. Now, you've seen in um, some examples before that we always do something with the top and an H comes out of it to cancel this H and then we can take the limit. You know, given that we don't know what F and G are here, we can't really manipulate them very much to try and get an H out of it. So we're going to employ a little trick. This is very common in mathematics that, you know, if you want to, uh, uh, if I want, I'm going to add something into this uh, numerator in the form of zero. Because if I add zero to it, uh, it doesn't change it. That's the nice thing about zero. All right, so this becomes f of x plus h times g of x plus h. And what I'm going to do is add zero in the following way. As negative f of x times g of x plus h plus f of x times g of x plus h. And then I've got that minus f of x, g of x on the end. I know this looks weird, but it makes things nice things happen, which is what we want. Okay, so just to remind you, this part here, that's just zero, right? Because I've got minus blob plus the same blob, so that's just zero. But now I can regroup. So if we look at um, uh, the first two terms in the uh, numerator, I can factor out the g of x plus h. So this becomes the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x plus h. And I'm going to factor it out of that, the first two terms, and that becomes f of x plus h minus f of x. And if I do it with the second two terms, same thing. I'm going to break the limit into two limits because the limit of a sum and difference of things is just the sum and difference of the limits. And so I can write this as the limit as h goes to 0. And now handle the next two terms in the numerator. Um, f of x is the common part now. So this becomes f of x times um, g of x plus h minus g of x and all of this, this is over h, oops, that's not right, uh, and this, this is all over h, now, I've got the limit of the product of two functions on the top, and the, uh, um, the limit rules say that the limit of a product is the product of the limits. So I could write this as the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x plus h times the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And for the second term, I'm going to split this into, the, I've got the limit of a product of two functions on the top, so I can split that up and write that as the limit at j goes to 0 of f of x times the limit as h goes to 0 of uh, g of x plus h. Let's move this up a bit here. g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. Now, the limit of g of x plus h as h goes to 0, um, as h goes to 0, this is just g of x. Um, so this just becomes g of x times. And this, you'll recognize because this is the definition from uh, first principles of the derivative of f, right? f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. You've seen this being used often. So this is just f prime plus. The limit of f of x as h goes to 0 is just f of x because there's no h's in there. So that's f of x times. And this piece also looks familiar. This is just the uh, g prime. That's the definition of the derivative of g. So that's just g prime. 
Now, because uh, multiplication is uh, uh, commutative, I can do it in either order. I'm going to write this as f prime of x times g of x plus g, uh, f of x times g prime of x. So this is the quotient, uh, sorry, the product rule. So to summarize this, that if h is the function of two, pro two uh, product of two functions, the derivative of the product of the two functions is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Okay, so that's what the previous thing said. So if I just uh, go down here, whoops. I'm just going to go and steal this here. Oh, maybe I don't know how to do that. Hold on. So I'll just write that out here. So um, h prime is, uh, I'm, I'm stating it in a particular way here because this is going to get used in the quotient rule and you'll see the, uh, the correspondence in a moment. Um, so it's the derivative of f, the derivative of the first function, times the second, plus the first, so that would be f of x, times the derivative of the second. Now, we're going to do this two ways. Um, if nothing else, just to convince you that this product rule works. Um, we've kind of proven it by from first principles, but you need to see it in action here. So I'm going to first expand this by expanding it first, just so that we can compare answers. So if I multiply this out, you end up getting 3x to the fifth plus x to the fourth plus x cubed. So that's distributing the x cubed. And now distributing the negative 1, negative 3x squared minus x minus 1. And nothing can uh, be uh, collected there. So we can calculate h prime as being 15x to the fourth plus 4x cubed plus 3x squared minus 6x minus 1. And then the derivative of negative 1, of course, is just 0. Now, let's use the product rule and see what we get. So h prime, it says, is the derivative of the first. So that would be 6x plus 1 times the second, so that would be x cubed minus 1, plus the first, which is 3x squared plus x plus 1, times the derivative of the second, which is 3x squared. And if we expand this, we end up getting 6x to the fourth minus 6x plus x cubed minus 1, so that comes from the first two things, plus, and now if we expand this, if I distribute the 3x squared, I get 9x to the fourth, plus 3x cubed, plus 3x squared, and if we collect up like terms, I end up getting 15x to the fourth, plus 4x cubed, plus 3x squared, uh, minus 6x, minus the 1. And if I go up a little bit here, yeah, just enough, you can see at the top here, um, we've got exactly the same answer. Okay, so this just demonstrates that the product rule works. Not that there was any doubt. All right, let's apply uh, using the product rule uh, to answer this question. It says, find the equations of the tangents lines at the points where the following intersect the x-axis. Well, um, we know that the zeros of this are going to be at negative 3. Let's do this in a different color. Negative 3. And um, x squared minus 1 would be 0 for positive 1 and negative 1. So negative 1 and positive 1. And given that this is a cubic term with the leading coefficient positive, um, 
we know that the, the behavior of this is uh, in this direction from Q3 to Q1. And so this particular function looks like, if I'll do this in a different color here, um, going up, coming around, coming down, going up, and then carrying on like that. So the question said, find the equation of the tangent lines at the points where the following intersect, intersect the x-axis. In other words, we're looking for the slopes of the tangents at these red dots. All right, so dy by dx, to use uh, Leibniz notation. I'll flip back and forth between the two notations just so that you get used to uh, using both of them. This one being the more intuitive, as I stated earlier, because it's sort of dy by dx looks like change in y over change in x, which is slope. All right, so we're using the product rules, the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, which is just one. So I end up getting 2x squared plus 6x plus x squared minus 1. And so this just ends up being 3x squared plus 6x minus 1. And so the slopes of the tangents, uh, this is the slope of the tangent at any x. And so dy by dx evaluated at x equals negative 3, which was the first of the x-intercepts there, would just be, um, if I put three, negative 3 into there, I get 27 minus 18, which is 9 minus 1, which is 8. Um, dy by dx evaluated at x equal to negative 1. That would be 3 times 1, which is 3, minus 6 is negative 3, minus 1 is negative 4. And finally, dy by dx evaluated at uh, x equal to 1. That would be 3 plus 6 is 9, minus 1, which is 8. And so if I were to just draw these tangents in here, just so that you can see how it looks, uh, one of them is like this, one of them is like that, the other one's like this. And so the first two actually have the same slope. You notice both of them on the outside here turned out to be 8. Now the question said find the equations of those tangent lines. Um, I'm just going to do one here, uh, and you can do the others on your own. So here's y is equal to mx plus b. We know the, um, the slope is uh, 8, so that's going into here. And the point of tangency, uh, that, that first 0 there is negative 3 and 0, so we're putting that into here. So I get 0 is equal to 8x, 8x is negative 3 plus b, and so b ends up being negative 24, oh, sorry, positive 24. And so the equation is y is equal to 8x plus 24. And you can see from the first one here that if we were to extend this uh, tangent line, you know, presumably up here somewhere, this is not to scale, uh, it would, you know, touch up 24. Now, I indicated to you in a previous session that uh, on the AP exam, they may expect uh, the answers to be given in uh, standard form. And so this one ends up being 8x minus y plus 24 is equal to 0. And you can do the others on your own. And if you do, you should get the following results. 4x plus y plus 4 is equal to 0. And the other one is 8x minus y minus 8 is equal to 0. You might want to try those on your own just to make sure that you're getting the right answers. All right. Now, how are we going to do this? This is a uh, quotient of functions, and we haven't talked about the quotient rule yet. Um, so we're going to just do this as a product. Oh, sorry, as a uh, well, first as a product rule. So I could write this as x squared minus two x uh, plus one, and it's being multiplied by x to the minus one. 
right? Because divided by x is the same as that. So we've got the product of two functions. So we're going to use uh, the product rule to do this. So it's the derivative of the first, so that would be 2x minus 2, times the second, so that's x to the minus 1, plus the first, so that would be x squared minus uh, 2x plus 1, times the derivative of the second, which would be negative x to the minus 2. And so this just becomes uh, 2x, 2 times x minus 1 all over x minus, and this ends up being x squared minus 2x plus 1 all over uh, x squared. And if we put all this together, common denominator is x squared. So this just becomes, this 2 becomes a 2x. So I get 2x squared minus 2x. And then from the second numerator, just minus x squared plus 2x minus 1. Uh, and that ends up being x squared the negative 2x and the positive 2x go away. And so I end up with just x squared minus 1 all over x squared. Okay, so that's making use of the product rule to do a, a quotient of functions. Now, this may not always be possible. Well, I suppose it always is, but um, I'm going to show you the quotient rule and then you can decide whether uh, sometimes you want to use the product rule or use it as a quotient rule. The algebra gets pretty messy here. Um, I'm going to show you first how to do the quotient rule um, uh, from first principles. And then we're going to take a look at how to use the quotient rule, how to determine the quotient rule using the product rule. All right, so let's do this one first. So we've got the quotient of two functions f divided by g, and now we want to calculate q prime. So q, which is that uh, quotient, uh, is just q of x plus h minus q of x all over h. So what does that become? Well, looking at q there, q of x plus h would simply be the limit here as h goes to 0. q of x plus h would be f of x plus h over g of x plus h right, that's q of x plus h, minus q of x, but q of x is just f of x over g of x. So far, so good. Oh, and then all divided, of course, by h. Equals. Limit as h goes to 0. Now, in order to do this, oops, I need a straight line here. In order to do this, I'm going to need to get a common denominator for that numerator. And that would be uh, g of x plus h times g of x. And this divided by h is just like, you know, divided by h over 1, so it's multiplied by 1 over h, so I'll just put this h on the bottom here. Now, that numerator... Uh, up there becomes uh, f of x plus h times g of x. So that was introduced into its uh, denominator that we didn't have before. Minus f of x times g of x plus h. Okay, so that's the that numerator there is that numerator up at the top there at the top of the screen. All right, so once again, we're going to uh, employ that uh, little trick that we learned previously of adding zero into this in a special form to make uh, something nice happen. So this becomes f of x plus h times g of x. And I'm going to add in negative f of x times g of x and a positive f of x times g of x. So there's my zero that I was adding. And then I've got this minus f of x times g of x plus h. 
and this is all over eight um, all over g of x plus h times g of x times h so keep in mind as i did before that this is just zero i'm allowed to add zero to something because it doesn't disturb anything it doesn't change the expression but now we regroup this so this becomes the limit as h goes to zero of so from the first two terms i'm going to factor out the g of x so g of x times f of x plus h minus f of x and this is all over this g of x plus h times g of x times h and then i'll add on to that the limit i'm breaking this uh, limit into two limits as you saw done earlier when i proved the product rule and here f of x is common so we're going to write the limit of f of x times and then this is g of x now i don't want this to read g of x minus g of x plus h so to figure to uh, sort that out i'm going to change this plus sign oops got rid of a little too much there i'm going to change this plus sign into a minus sign minus sign and then i can write this as g of x plus h minus g of x all over that same denominator g of x plus h times g of x times h okay so you can see this minus times g of x plus h there's the minus g of x plus h and then the minus times the negative g of x that's positive g of x which is what i had here and we factored out the f of x all right let's tidy this up i know it looks messy but it'll turn out nice so this ends up i can um, again i've got the limit of g of x times stuff so i'm going to take the g of x out of this it doesn't depend on uh, h so i can just write uh, this as g of x times the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h uh, minus f of x all over um, this becomes let's see oh well i'll just write out the whole thing g of x plus h times g of x times h minus and same thing here this f of x doesn't depend on h and so i'm going to write the f of x outside times the limit as h goes to zero of uh, g of x plus h minus g of x all over that same denominator we're almost done and what does this oh uh yeah that's good and now i've got g of x now the limit of this expression as h goes to zero you'll notice that we end up getting um, g of x squared on the bottom right g of x squared on the bottom so i'll just write and g of x doesn't depend right once h goes to zero this is just g of x on the bottom so i'll just write that as g of x squared and the top part the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h uh, that's just f prime so that's f prime of x and then i got that minus sign then we've got f of x um, times and the same thing's happening here if i let h go to zero these two terms both become g of x so i could just write that as one over g of x squared and then the limit of g of x plus h minus g of x all over that h that just becomes um, uh, g prime and now since both of these things have g of x squared on the bottom i can write this as f prime of x times g of x i'm just putting the f prime in front of the g minus and then this is f of x times g prime of x 
and this is all over g of x squared. And there's the quotient rule. Now, if you notice, the top part looks very much like the product rule. And that's the reason why I wrote f prime first when I did the product rule. Because it looks just like the product rule in the top, except the plus sign is not a plus, it's a minus here. So it's the derivative of the, you know, this is top and bottom now rather than first and second. So derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Okay, so there's the quotient rule. So now let's take a look at uh, using this. Oh, I was going to develop this thing uh, using the product rule. You might think, why did I do the other one when it was so messy algebraically? Uh, if nothing else, to give you the experience of uh, uh, doing algebra and not messing it up when we got uh, messy fractions like that. So using this, uh, using the product rule, I could write this as f of x times g of x raised to the negative 1, right? Because that's what that is. And so now q prime of x, which is the derivative of this quotient, would be using the product rule, derivative of the first times the second, so that's just g of x to the minus 1, plus the first times the derivative of the second. Now the derivative of the second is going to be minus g of x raised to the minus 2, but you'll remember that because um, uh, I need to use the chain rule and take the derivative of g, so that would become g prime of x on the end. All right, and so now I can, let's see, what can we do with this? So this becomes f prime of x over g of x. There's a minus sign here, so minus f of x I think I forgot something here. f of x um, times g prime of x all over uh, g of x squared. No, I think we're good. Now, to put those two functions or fractions together, the common denominator is g of x squared. And so this numerator needs to be multiplied by g of x minus f of x times g prime of x. And that one didn't change. And there we have the quotient rule again. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Okay, much simpler uh, proof using the product rule. Whereas back here, I did by from first principles, and we got exactly the same answer. All right, let's use the uh, quotient rule. Now see here, you could do it with the product rule, you could do it with the quotient rule. You might want to try it both ways. Um, just to see that you're getting the same answer. All right, so f prime would be the derivative of the top, that's 6x, times the bottom, 1 minus x cubed, minus the top, so that would be 3x squared, times the derivative of the bottom, which is negative 3x squared, all over, all over the bottom squared, which is 1 minus x cubed squared. All right, fix, don't do anything with the bottom. You know, the simple, uh, factored form like that is the simplified form, so we don't want to be expanding uh, the denominator. So just leave it like this. But the top, you may have terms that you can collect. So this ends up being 6x minus 6x to the fourth, and then minus minus plus 9x to the fourth. And so we end up with uh, 9 minus 6, so 3x to the fourth minus 6x all over 1 minus x cubed squared. So you might want to try and do this uh, you know, using the product rule. Uh, I'm not going to do that here, but you might want to try just to see that you get the same answer. Because I could write this as this, and now use the product rule on this, because we've got the product of two functions. So try that and see if you get the same answer.
Now, this example has got a uh, uh, two power functions, and I've done this example to show you that inevitably, when this when you have a function that looks like this, there's going to be a lot of common factoring, because you've seen f of x and its derivative and g of x and its derivative all show up in this calculation. And so you can expect that there's going to be a lot of common factoring. So let's see what happens. f prime of x is, so it's the derivative of the top, so that's 4 times x plus 1 cubed, times the derivative of what's inside, but that's just 1, right? That's just chain rule. So derivative of the top times the bottom, oh, sorry, derivative of the top times the bottom, so that's x minus 5 to the fifth, minus the top, so x plus 1 to the fourth, times the derivative of the bottom, which is x minus 5 to the fourth, all over uh, the bottom squared, which is x minus 5 to the tenth. Now, don't go expanding this stuff because it's going to get very messy. Um, what you should notice, though, is that x plus 1 cubed and x plus 1 to the fourth and there's an x minus 5 to the 5th and an x minus 5 to the 4th. And as promised, there'll be lots of common factoring. The 4 and 5 have nothing in common, so I can't do anything with that. But in the case of the x plus 1, I can factor out an x plus 1 cubed, because that's the smaller of the two. And I can take out an x minus 5 to the 4th, because it's common. And let's see what's left. I'll do you square brackets just to show you what the result in the brackets here are. Um, so the 4 is left. And I've got one of those x minus 5s minus that 5 is left, the and one of the x plus 1s is left. All over x minus 5 to the 10th. And now this x minus 5 to the 4th will take out 4 of those, so I'll end up with 6 left there. And so on the top, I end up with x plus 1 cubed. And inside the brackets here, I got 4x minus 5x, which would be negative x. And negative 20 minus 5, negative 25. All over x minus 5 to the 6th. And about the only thing I might want to do is factor out that negative at the beginning and write it with the leading negative. But other than that, you could just leave it the way it was. x plus 25 all over x minus 5 to the sixth. In rare occasions, the part that's in the uh, square brackets here may have ended up having being an x minus 5, and it was, then you can take out another one here, but um, that very rarely would happen. Anyhow, let's move on. Or are we done? Oh, one more screen left. This is really just a wrap-up thing. So it's saying if f of x is equal to the quotient of these two functions, determine what this is. It says what procedure would you use and why to do this the most efficient way? Well, some of you are going to think, oh, I'll just use the quotient rule because I just learned that. Others might want to uh, write this as a product rule by taking the x plus 1 to the top. However, you should always see if you can simplify first. And so... This function, I think the top uh, factors there, I'm looking for numbers that multiply to 2, multiply to 2, and add up to 3. Uh, the numbers that work are 2 and 1. What I'm doing is I'm putting them this on the bottom. I used to teach this in grade 10, uh, this fractions method of coming up with the factors. So I put the numbers from this underneath uh, lines like that to make them into fractions and then put the a value on top. We're factoring a simple, uh, a complex trinomial. And then uh, pretend there's little x's sitting here. Actually, I can do that after. Uh, first, we're going to just reduce these fractions, so that becomes 1 over 1 and 2 over 1. And then just pretend that there's little x's over here and read the answers downwards. And so this becomes x plus 1, right? Because that's a positive one there, and this is a positive one. And the other one is 2x plus 1. And this is all over uh, x plus 1. And after having factored it, I see, oh, this and this cancel. And so this is really just 2x plus 1, in which case f prime is just 2.
So you could have done it using the product rule. You may want to try that and do it with the quotient rule. At the end of the day, this should end up just being 2. Give that a shot and see what happens. And I think that's it. Yep. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, hopefully you'll keep in touch and watch the others that are coming.